Thank you very much, uh, everybody, and uh, thanks very much, Angela. Uh, this is a very exciting time uh, to be working in this area. And Angela asked me to give a broad overview of uh, the potential for NHS transformation and the introduction of precision medicine. I'm going to give you a personal perspective uh, from somebody who's been working in precision medicine uh, for uh, many years uh, and trying to uh, introduce that into the NHS. So it is an exciting time, from, and things have been moving, perhaps people say slowly, but in terms of uh, from 1953, uh, when Watson Crick discovered the structure of DNA, to the beginning of the century, uh, when the Human Genome Project was sequenced and published, uh, to the announcement of 100,000 Genomes Project. Um, it's been a, a marvelous transformation, but what we now need to do is obviously take that into the NHS for patient benefit. And really, if you look at NHS transformation, I really like this uh, um, definition. Uh, the URL uh, is at the bottom. It's from business context. But really, if you consider the NHS as an organization, what we're looking for really is introducing a profound and radical change that will orientate the NHS in a new direction that will uh, lead to a better or different level of effectiveness. And that's a lot to be able to get through and, and really try to implement, but that's what we need to be able to go to for patient benefit. And the reason we need to be able to do that and improve what we do at the moment is really based on the fact that we are all show variability. And variability has been known about as, uh, from the last century. This is a picture of William Oslo, who's the father of medicine. And he basically said that variability is the law of life. No two faces are the same. No two bodies are alike, et cetera. And, and the way we respond to environmental influences, the way we develop disease, the way we respond to drugs, is all related to variability. And that can be largely traced to our human genome. Um, there are 3 billion base pairs in our human genome, uh, but only 0.1% is different. Now, you may say 0.1% isn't very much, but 0.1% of 3 billion is 3 million uh, bases. So if you can, you can imagine how much differences you can make into different combinations you can make from 3 million base pairs. Um, and this variability is seen everywhere, uh, everywhere in the world, uh, even uh, in Liverpool, irrespective of what the internet <laughs> tells you. So if you have this variability, what do we do at the moment uh, in terms of treating diseases? Where we treat on the basis of a disease being a phenotype. Professor Suhill mentioned about subphenotypes of disease. Uh, at the moment, it is all based on one particular disease. So somebody comes in with Alzheimer's, it's just one form of Alzheimer's. Somebody comes in with asthma, it's just one form of asthma. But we know that there are many different forms of asthma, etc. And we need to be able to define that, and, and, and the taxonomy, the changes taxonomy that will occur will allow us to be able to define that. But at the moment, we do, uh, treat it on the one basis of one dose fits all. And, and drug companies do that as well. And this is uh, something from a previous GSK vice president. And he said that the vast majority of GSK drugs, more than 90%, only work in 30 or 50% of the people. Um, and he said that in front of journalists, ended up on the front page of The Independent. Uh, the next day, the day after, he ended up in front of the chief executive trying to explain why the GSK share price had fallen. <laughs> so you have to be careful. <laughs> The other aspect of it is how do you prevent adverse drug reactions? Adverse drug reactions are a huge burden to the NHS. At this very moment in time, if you look at the whole NHS bed bait, eight, uh, uh, 10 800 bed hospitals, that's 8,000 beds in the NHS, are occupied by patients with adverse drug reactions. And genetic factors, et cetera, may be responsible for part of that. And we, uh, precision medicine, personalized medicine, has to be able to come into this as well. And, and so what we are really looking towards is trying to implement precision medicine uh, into the NHS. Uh, and precision medicine, and this is the Innovate UK definition, is where you use diagnostic tests to select the most appropriate treatment for individual patients, the right drug at the right time, earlier screening and treatment, smarter monitoring, and adjustment of treatments to improve clinical outcomes, uh, reduce adverse effects, uh, improve uh, the sort of, uh, therapy of many different diseases. Now, obviously, the UK is ahead at the moment, and the United States always wants to do things bigger and better. Um, and, and so well, while the UK was saying about 100,000 genomes, uh, Obama made a, a sort of announcement about a million 
genomes. But actually, the scale of funding that they're going to provide is 215 million, which is not actually that much to be able to do a million uh, genomes. So, but therefore, the UK is still ahead. And the important thing is the NHS. The NHS really try, you know, gets us there, uh, and the NHS can be the driver actually to make the UK the world leader uh, in this particular area. But there are many challenges, but huge numbers of opportunities as well, and we need, we need to be able to uh, really grasp those opportunities. And, and the overall benefits are huge. The benefits are huge for industry. Uh, we, this can actually create wealth for the UK economy as well as improve health uh, for our patients. The diagnostics industry will actually lead to many more new markets. For pharma, uh, targeting therapy, pharma used to operate on a model of having a blockbuster. And the definition of blockbuster is having a drug which earns a billion pounds per year. Uh, but now they're moving towards a niche buster model, which really targets therapy for patients with particular subphenotypes, which actually improve the benefit risk profile. Um, and the better treatments will be important for patients with improved clinical outcomes, better for doctors in terms of uh, treating the right disease at the right time, as I said. And overall, in terms of cost effectiveness, this will, in the end, it, there, is, there has to be some investment at the beginning, but one needs to look on a longer term scale uh, beyond the five years of government uh, um, and, and, and in terms of elections, etc., one really has to long a lo long-term scale for actually uh, uh, having more cost-effective therapy. So, what we, we are in a good position uh, in Liverpool and the Northwest Coast to really bring this together. And Angela mentioned that there is something that we've formed, and partnerships are hugely important, which is the Northwest Coast Genomics Healthcare Alliance, which is really uh, run through Liverpool Health Partners, but works with the AHSN, tries to bring things together, links the GMC with the university research centers to allow for a bi-directional transfer of knowledge and information. Um, and so it, what it's trying to do, this Northwest Coast Genomics Healthcare Alliance, and doing it uh, well, is to cover research, education, and training, and service delivery. And obviously, uh, this, is, this is crucial in terms of acting as a catalyst to bring uh, everything together, together with uh, the GMC uh, in, the, in the Northwest Coast. And this gives you a much um, more detailed picture of the overall research and clinical excellence that's available uh, within uh, the, sort of, uh, this area, the Northwest Coast. So what we have is the Northwest Coast Genomic Medicine Center and the other genomic medicine centers surrounding it. And that's really in terms of identifying particular mutations, targets, et cetera. Um, and then we need to undertake the translational research uh, in the blue, um, and then develop the evidence base. You need evidence to be able to implement something into the NHS, um, and the clinical trials, centers, et cetera, allow us to be able to develop the evidence base, which then is uh, then taken into the NHS in terms of diffusion of innovation into the NHS. So what we have is a whole loop and closing of the loop where we go from discovery right through to implementation. I think that this particular region is very well placed to be able to take advantage of the genome genomics revolution uh, and really help our patient populations. But what we also do uh, in this particular region is that we are leading a network uh, which, is, which, which is called pharmacogenetic stratified medicine. Um, you will know that there are many terms, uh, personalized medicine, stratified medicine, precision medicine. Um, and, the, and the terms keep on changing. And I think you will know that we'll have succeeded when it's called medicine. <laughs> But, but at the moment, while it is called, you know, the, these different kinds of terms, um, we do run a network which is called the Pharmacogenetic Stratified Medicine, and Christine McNamee, who's sitting in the audience, is a manager for this network. It's really been set up and is funded by Innovate UK, set up to facilitate access to interaction with uh, individuals working uh, in uh, the stratified me medicine uh, clinical research infrastructure, bring clinical clinicians, uh, researchers together, industry together. It really has to be partnership. Um, and, and so through the work that Christine has done, um, there are now about at least three to 400 people on the research database and that they can connect with each other uh, to be able to really sort of work together to be able to take things into practice. I'm going to give you three examples to, and to provide you with how, what, what potential um, advancements can occur. Um, and one is on cancer, one is on rare disease, and one is in another area. Um, so he, here's an example of how 
sequencing technologies can actually lead you to identify a new drug. So this is uh, work undertaken at the Sanger Institute where they sequenced the tumor from a patient with malignant melanoma. They were able to identify that 50% of the tumors had a driver mutation in a gene called BRAF, which led to a mutated BRAF protein. So working with the company, they were able to produce a new drug called vemurafenib, which actually inhibits the mutated BRAF protein. Um, and, and if you could look at this PET scan, um, before treatment, the patient has lots of red spots and so on, which are all metastases uh, in the bone, liver, etc. Two weeks after treatment, all the metastases have disappeared because of this particular treatment. This targeted treatment is now available for other cancers, um, uh, lung cancer, etc. Um, but but uh, you know, there is much more work to be done. Unfortunately, what happens is the cancer comes back uh, after six months or so. Um, and so the next stage is how do we take that further forward to have a long-lasting remission? And so there is an opportunity here, but also challenge of how you actually lead to long-lasting remission from these kind of cancers. Here's another example of uh, um, uh, work which was undertaken with the rare disease, cystic fibrosis, which is the commonest autosomal recessive disorder uh, in northern European populations. Um, and the mutation for cystic fibrosis was actually discovered in 1987. It's on chromosome 7. It's in a protein called, gene called cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator. Uh, it took 25 years to um, develop the first drug to be able to interact with that particular gene. Um, and, and the drug, which only affects one particular, or oh, a, a, a small number of mutations, uh, which are seen in about 4% of the CF population, uh, was called Ivocaftor. This has, made, uh, this has had a fantastic and dramatic impact on those patients with those mutations uh, with cystic fibrosis with improvement in the, uh, in the lung function. Um, and uh, it's now been expanded to other mutations which are shown uh, at the bottom. So the important thing here is that it took 25 years to be able to actually develop a drug based on a mutation. But that was when people weren't really working in partnership. I think what's going on now, the exciting things which are coming through where people are starting to work together, uh, things can actually go into um, development uh, implementation much more quickly. Um, and that is really dependent on partnerships. So when new mutations are discovered as part of the 100,000 Genomes Project, well, hopefully there will be new drug targets discovered and new drugs de developed because of that. But also all drugs which can be repurposed uh, to be able to use uh, in those particular uh, populations. Then there is the other issue of existing drugs and how do we deal with them. So here's an example of warfarin, which is used by 1% of the UK population. Different people require different doses of warfarin. Some may require half a milligram a day, some require 20 milligrams a day. And genetic factors play a major role uh, in that dose requirements. And these are the genes which are important. I won't go through them. But we were able to under, undertake work with a company, LGC in Teddington, um, and develop a point of care diagnostic test. And we were able to test for these genes in a randomized control trial and show that if you could actually define your dose based on your gene, genes, uh, you did better than the current clinical practice at the moment. So we're working with the AHSN uh, in the, uh, to be able to try to implement this uh, within the Northwest Coast and then hopefully uh, throughout the UK. The reason for putting this up is actually when about 75,000 different individuals are sequenced as part of 100,000 genomes, I think I, I'm estimating 75,000 because they'll be at, uh, in sort of the uh, um, somatic samples as well. Then what do you do uh, when you actually get a pharmacogenetic variant as well uh, like this? Because these patients will be getting older, they may require some of these drugs. So do you ignore that kind of pharmacogenomic variant? Or do you start using the literature data that's there to actually uh, change the way you treat that patient? At the moment, that's not really covered. Um, and, and so what we are hoping to be able to do is to uh, develop a Genome uh, England Clinical Interpretation Partnership and work with people throughout the country to start looking at pharmacogenomic variants and see how we actually take that forward. There are some ethical implications here as well. If you know what the patient sequence is, you know they react adversely to that particular drug because of the genetic mutation, do you ignore it? And uh, is, that, is that ethical to be able to ignore that? And so we need to be able to take that forward as well. 
But I, th I think one of the things that we've got to understand is genomics is just one part of it. Um, scientists, uh, clinicians, um, uh, all of us, in fact, are reductionists. And we tend to uh, explain phenomena on, on the basis of a much simpler uh, kind of set of criteria. Um, and so it's like, just like having a, a single straight road. And this is what you might find uh, in the United States. Uh, if you go there, you can just drive straight on and you'll get to where you want to. However, we know the life is much more complicated. <laughs> uh, this is Spaghetti Junction, uh, and, and I frequently got lost in there despite the sort of satellite navigation. So, so we need to be able to think how we can overcome this. So genomics just forms one part of what we do. There are many different aspects that we need to be able to look at, the epigenome, transcriptome, etc. We need to bring this together in a systems approach, integrate everything together so that we can actually identify the biomarkers that we need um, and the diagnostic tests we need so that we can actually truly practice precision medicine for the benefit of our patients. That's not going to be easy. It's going to take a lot of work, a lot of partnership working, uh, GMCs plus other centers plus other, other experts um, and working with industry to really uh, make a difference. So what we are really facing, it is a very exciting time. Lots of new things coming together, the 100,000 Genomes Project, GMCs, the Precision Medicine Infrastructure, the Precision Medicine Catapult was, was, was announced uh, only uh, last week or so. Um, and, and so what we are really going towards is, is, is disruptive innovation. Um, and, and really what this is all going to do uh, is to disrupt the current clinical pathways we have. From the very beginning, in terms of diagnosis of disease, it's not just one disease, but there are many subphenotypes in that, and the new taxonomy disease, right through to having very sophisticated precision diagnostics, which tell us what the mutation is or whatever the biomarker is, which then ultimately leads to the uh, treatment you require to get the best treatment for your patients and so on. And, and a disruptive innovation is similar to what happened with uh, email. We used to use snail mail, faxes, and so on. Now we use email. Some people may say that wasn't really a good innovation because it makes my life really bad, having to, have to, having to answer 200 emails a day. But nevertheless, it has been an innovation of some sort. And I think organizational transformation inevitably involves disruptive innovation, and we need to be able to embrace that in disruptive innovation to really take things forward for precision medicine. So thank you very much for your attention.